Hello, and welcome to another edition of SIF Virtual. I'm David Reisick, and I'm pleased to be coming to you from Honor Health. We have a great case and a great lineup of uh, physician experts uh, for this case. This is going to be a left atrial appendage watchman implantation in a patient who's had persistent anemia. Uh, let me introduce the crew. We have with us, uh, no stranger to SIF and SIF Virtual, my partner, Dr. Robert Burke. Uh, Dr. Burke is going to be showing us some beautiful echocardiographic images. Uh, you uh, know uh, Dr. Pratik Dalal. Dr. Dalal is in his first year, just joined us from William Beaumont Hospital. And we have a newcomer to not only Honor Health, but to the SIF family, and that is Dr. Raul Doshi. Uh, so glad to have you with us. This is our first live case together. This is a pleasure, now, an absolute pleasure. David. My, my pleasure, my honor to have you with us. I'm gonna ask you, if you would, Pratik, why don't you be the, the workhorse? Sure. And why don't you be the sort of the voice and the commentary of this case, okay? Oh, excellent. All right. Uh, uh, Pratik, why don't you take us through the case, and then we're going to do this case from uh, transeptal on. So, uh, Pratik, why don't you take us through it? Sure. Next slide, please. So we have a 74-year-old female here. She has chronic iron deficiency anemia requiring blood transfusion and chronic iron infusions. She's had proximal atrial fibrillation since 2018. Again, the iron deficiency anemia and hypertension. Next slide, please. Her Chad's VAS score calculates to three. Importantly, this has been performing, performed with shared decision making with her primary cardiologist as well as hematology and oncology. Next slide, please. Over 80 to 90% of my cases, I use a CT to screen patients prior to Watchman implantation. Um, I think it helps us with the uh, transeptal approach, device sizing, and oftentimes, but very rarely, excluding some patients in favor of the Watchman Flex, which will hopefully come out in the near future. Here we have a minimum diameter of 19 with the maximum diameter of 22.2, giving us a perimeter of around 65.6 millimeters. Next slide. These are some different views and definitely the most important being the REO caudal view for us, the 30-30. It looks like based on CT that um, we have adequate depth to deliver the either a 21 or 24 millimeter device. We will use multi-modality imaging for the procedure and Dr. Burke here with the TE will help refine, refine some of these measurements. Next. So TE guidance, of course, we'll be using a transeptal puncture with the Bayless Torflex guiding sheet and first across system. Um, I like to spend some time in the left upper pulmonary vein thinking that provides the most safety. And we'll be using the 14 French dry seal watchman delivery sheet. Based upon the CT and TE, we'll decide whether we prefer to use an anterior curve here or double curve. Dr. Isaac has had a lot of uh, experience here with the first across system and I'll have him talk about that in more detail. So we're going to do our transeptal today with the VersaCross system from our friends at Bayless. And I've, I've really grown very fond of this device and I'm pretty much doing all uh, of our uh, transeptals with this. Um, you can see the, uh, the sheath and there's an inner dilator and this inner dilator has a metal uh, component to it. And what you can do if you want is you can shape this uh, like such, and it really holds its shape uh, beautifully. And uh, depending on the size of the right atrium and uh, the need to reach the, uh, the septum, uh, you can really uh, bend this. And the other thing is you can manipulate it. And when you're manipulating it, I think this is probably the closest to a one-to-one -one, uh, torque response uh, ratio of any device that we have for transeptals, and that's why uh, I love this. Now, the other uh, very interesting thing about this is this wire, uh, it's basically very similar to the, maybe we can get it, there you go. Uh, it's very similar to the other Bayless wire in that it, uh, it coils and therefore it has uh, safety features when you advance, but um, I'm gonna just, Nicole, why don't you help me to do this? Keep uh, focused right on the catheter. We can put this inside the catheter like such. 
very easy to place it in the catheter. And we usually start with this inside the catheter at or near the tip, but not exposed. And if you can zoom right in on the catheter tip, zoom right in there, perfect. And so when you go up against the septum, the wire is retracted into the catheter. And then we just advance the wire out slightly. And that wire is hooked up on the back end to our RF and that wire is what's used to uh, burn a hole in the septum. And then if you could zoom in again on, and once you uh, burn through the septum, the wire is advanced and it forms this safety coil. And then you can advance the entire catheter across. A really, really safe and uh, uh, really slick system for performing the transeptal. And so that's what we're using today for our transeptal. So, Dr. Doshi, you've heard the clinical presentation, you've looked at the initial images. G give me a sense of uh, your feelings about the case, appropriateness, well-chosen case. Uh, kind of give us your, 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 uh, your overview of this. Absolutely. So, thank you, David. Um, you know, of course, I'm going to have to insert one bias, Dr. Delal, because uh, you didn't mention anything about whether the patient had symptoms in atrial fibrillation. So, as an electrophysiologist, <laughs> Um, we also treat atrial fibrillation, right? But in terms of the appropriateness of left atrial appendage occlusion, I mean, this is an ideal candidate. Somebody who requires multiple blood transfusions, iron deficiency anemia, who you want to avoid long-term anticoagulation at the same time is obviously a candidate for short-term anticoagulation, which is a, you know, ideal situation for the appendage occlusion. Uh, even though there's, as you know, accumulating data that we may not necessarily need uh, even short-term anticoagulation in these patients. But no, I think it's a very appropriate case and you outlined very nicely regarding the shared decision making uh, with the informed consent. So absolutely appropriate. Great, let's see a transeptal. Yep. So while Dr. Dalal is getting set up for the transeptal, obviously with the uh, equipment that he's already outlined, it's always interesting to talk about where to transeptal, right? Uh, back in the day, it was the standard fare to just think about a low, uh, and, or inferior and posterior, posterior. stick, right? Um, I don't know. So, Bob, I'm actually curious to get your opinion on this as well. I mean, most people that we do, they have adequate left atrial size, and I'm not sure that posterior is so critical. Uh, and then we think safety, right? So a mid-mid is might be a little bit safer in a small atrium. Um, so you can see here on so the TE images. low and relatively posterior that's, right now. That's looking this looks fairly very perfect. safe. Yep. Want to take this here, Bob? You're clean. Yep. Let's come on, please. I think. So, so now the wire, so this is important. There's the wire. Wire burned through and very safely uh, forms its uh, preformed uh, coil to make the bit. advancement of it, uh, you know, a very safe undertaking. And popped. There we go. That's beautiful. Perfect. Can we have the soft wire, please? Bob, what's your thoughts as far as CT imaging, as far as directing the location? You know, we, we've talked about the anterior chicken wings and maybe taking an anterior and superior approach for those patients like other people have advocated. You know, this is a thing that Rodney Horton at Texas Arrhythmia talks about a lot and certainly makes sense to be coaxial with the appendage ostium in deploying the device, which is, of course, the goal. Absolutely. I think that having the CT and actually looking at the, uh, the full volume of the left atrium and the relationship of the atrial septum, or at least the fossa, to the uh, left atrial appendage is really important. So we can get a lot out of that uh, without ever having touched the patient. So I think that those, that pre-procedural planning is critically important. So uh, Raul, in the uh, sort of the pre-procedural discussion, uh, Maybe we had uh, some varied opinions over. on what size we were going to use. Maybe you and Bob can discuss what you saw on CT and what additional images we got on transesophageal echocardiography. Absolutely. So, you know, Bob's the expert here, so I'm going to defer, but there's no doubt that there are differences in the techniques, right? There's no doubt about that. And Part of it has to do with, of course, just the mode of modality of imaging. Right? TE, TE tends to uh, 
underestimate, CT tends to overestimate, both related to the technique and where they draw the planes. Uh, but Bob has very nicely outlined, even with 3D, at the level of the circumplex, which is the plane that we're trying to deploy the device. Uh, and so I think the 3D pictures are beautiful. Having said that, you know, there might be an old bias, but we do rely a lot on real-time angiography uh, because, of course, conditions change, and angiography really does give us a nice sort of uh, overall view of how much we can really get away with. Uh, because a good opacified appendage uh, and comparing that to the, the delivery sheet is fairly accurate. And it's the way we used to do things uh, routinely, even with, with before Your even pass criteria. How important is it, uh, Bob and, uh, and Roel, to, to adequately hydrate these patients uh, when they're, uh, by the time they've come into the lab or, or interprocedurally if they appear to be dry? That's critically important, and actually that was a bit of an echo issue early on, and there was uh, some early stuff that came out of Australia that uh, looked at not having adequate hydration and not having an adequately elevated left atrial pressure, and seeing that you could get a difference in measurement on the left atrial appendage of several millimeters, which clearly is more than enough to cause changes in uh, your device selection, and unfortunately, going back into the original, very first trial stuff, uh, potential embolization of devices. So, Raul, uh, if you just looked at the CT imaging, you would have chosen what size for this particular case? I would have chosen a 24, and it looked like there was perhaps enough workable depth to even get a bigger device if you needed to. Um, but the images that Bob's getting now are looking a little smaller. Bob, so, are you at a point where you can show us your images? Uh, yeah, we're up inside the uh, left upper pulmonary vein right now. Uh, do you guys want to go into the uh, appendage with the pigtail? I think that that's actually a, a good point just to highlight just in terms of technique because there are operators that do this with catheters swimming around in the... Um, swimming around in the left atrium to cannulate the appendage. And I think from just a safety and stability standpoint, Dr. DeLal's comments on just routinely parking your delivery sheet in the left superior and then simply allowing your pig to drop into the appendage is just safer. It's easier. It's much, much easier. It's just recording left atrial pressure here. I think I'm happy with that. Around, yeah, we have yeah. a left atrial pressure of around 14 here, so I think that's adequate yep. here for size. Tens are, tens are target, and that's yep. more than fine. And thank you for outlining a vein that should be ablated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking ahead. Plan that's B. right. Bob, okay, I think your I'm in trajectory the looks very good for the appendage, and are you, you are there now. Oh, nice. So, you know, it's interesting where you're bringing up the whole, as far as the stick position, but it's, a lot of that came from essentially single curve sheets. And, you know, the dual curve has become, in most operators, uh, the work sheet. There's absolutely no doubt. Because it's, you're just going to be Mega coaxial point. majority of the time. So we've got a good areo or areo caudal view. And that outlines actually our landing zone really nicely. That's beautiful. Yep, and you can see that chicken wing. Yeah. You can also see that small posterior lobe that you need to cover. Okay, so Bob, uh, he was thinking a 24 and possibly even squeezing a 27 in based on the CT imaging. Uh, give us uh, sort of a, a review of what your echo imaging uh, suggests the uh, strategy may be. Yeah, so right now they're going to be guiding mostly on yeah. fluoro for what they have to do. So we can go back and just review what we've seen so far on echo. And before we get working, we typically go through with uh, standard biplane imaging. And we'll go at 0, 45, 90, 135. And we get our baseline images. So we had a 0 and a 90. You can see our chicken wing here is actually pretty well laid out. Uh, we didn't see that as well on CT, um, but definitely you can see it here. And 45 and 135 also shows that chicken wing. 
where our maximum distance uh, dimension was about 17 based on 2D imaging. And then we went into 3D getting a full volume of the left atrium. What we do is that we actually go in and actually go through the long axis of the appendage and then we can take our Z plane, this is the X, Y and Z plane, pull our Z plane down and we can actually then go to make measurements like this, showing where the uh, effective landing zone should be for the device. Went through it again one more time just because I wanted to make sure. Have our Z plane and our dimension here is about 18 by 14 with a little bit of push into the tissue. One thing that you note on echo as opposed to CT is that we generally push a little bit into tissue. Uh, we do that for measurement of the annulus uh, for TAVR. Uh, similarly, I've taken to do that with the Watchman device as well. On CT, you try not to go into tissue and you really try to have that contrast tissue interface as where you're gonna make your measurement. Again, that does tend to uh, shift what the measurements are gonna look like when you compare CT to echo. That's great. That's great. Ro, the uh, ACT came back at 298. Where do you like to run these uh, on these types of procedures? So guidelines are more than 200 to 250 for a watchman, but actually we're comfortable pushing up, up even higher nowadays. So I think around 300 is perfectly acceptable. As you know, for catheter ablations, we push them up ab above 400. So we're in good shape. Then. Yeah, okay. we're in great shape, actually. Good. And I think actually it tells you the illustration of the appropriate location for transeptal and with a dual curved sheath, if you just see in this in a straightforward flow image where Pratik has actually put the sheath following the pig, absolutely outlines the workable depth, right, with the sheath position coaxial to the appendage ostium, right? And you can see the first marker band, which is a 21. We've got a little bit more depth than that. And if you look at the size of the device, it looks like it should take about a 24, right? Um, and so we definitely have the size. If you split the uh, most distal and the second marker band, I think we have the size for, or the depth for, a workable depth for a 24. Okay, so, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me pose a challenge to you. So let's say you're gonna use a 24, and all of a sudden you discover there's only one 24 in the lab, and the first one, uh, first uh, attempt doesn't deploy like you want it to. Then what's your next choice? Are you going to push the limits of the 27, or are you going to downsize? What are you going to do? I think it depends on your measurements. And so right here, if I was going to err, I think you'd be adequately compressed with a 21. Okay. Um, so I might go 21, 21 if I couldn't get a 24. But a 24 is just gives you that much more fabric to cover. Yep. Um, you know, there was that one, and actually Bob's pictures outlined, there was one little ridge where it might influence how the device expands, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have fabric covering everything. So I think a 24 gives us our best shot. I'd use it, and I'd wonder why we don't have a second one, Christy. <laughs> yeah. I think I do have a couple more millimeters to get for yeah, depth. So absolutely. I think I'll be able to get the 24, so. No Great. doubt, absolutely no doubt. Actually, let's put a little bit of counter clock there and see if I can just advance it a touch. So that's an important point, right? When you're very finely Ooh, negotiating awesome. Uh, negotiating sure that uh, sh outer sheath, you want to maintain some counterclockwise torque so it sort of tracks anterior, that dual curve that allows you to be coaxial to the yeah, Pretty much against the wall here. Yeah. Right? You're right there. So you would park it right there yeah. and then get everything yeah. all prepped. You could probably get away nice. with a 21 as well, but if you can get a 24 in there, as long as we're not over compressed. I think, I think you're exactly right. So while we wait for the device to get prepped, uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Doshi a question. Mm -hmm. How far away do you think we are for getting rid of the 45-day anticoagulation and maybe just using aspirin and Plavix post-procedure, like from registry data, for example, from Canada and whatnot? So it, it, the answer, of course, it depends on the device, right? So if we're talking about this device that we're deploying today, there is reasonable data uh, from uh, you know, s registry series like Evolution and obviously from ASAP uh, that you can in most cases get away with dual antiplatelet or actually even no anticoagulation, though you do see a higher number of DRT. Now that doesn't correlate with the higher number of TIA-CVA. 
but you clearly see higher DRT, but it's still a relatively low number. Um, the construction of our next generation device, which Pratik already talked about, we're going to prep through here, yeah, um, is obviously different not just in its usability and its safety for deployment, but also related to where the threaded insert, how big that amount of nitinol is exposed. And so the tendency for DRT should be less, and all the data that we have thus far, it's less. Uh, recently just presented with, uh, uh, with Pinnacle, right? So I think in the future, we will be able to get away with minimal or no anticoagulation uh, as compared to the 45-day protocol. Well, uh, the 45-day protocol, uh, it, for those who aren't familiar with it, where, where did that, where, from where was that derived? It was just a cookbook formulation from Protect and Prevail. It's really nothing more than that. That's the prospective data that we have, so that's what we use. Uh, now, we obviously know that there is a real risk of DRT or CVATIA. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, Watchman patients, they do have ischemic or bland strokes. Uh, but the trade-off, of course, is at risk of that hemorrhagic stroke. And I think that's important. When we talk about these patients, you know, we seem to forget that the type of therapeutic regimen associated with the greatest degree of iatrogenia in medicine is anticoagulants. Uh, and we have good long-term data with this therapy regarding mortality reduction because you convert the risk of hemorrhagic strokes to perhaps less significant ischemic strokes. Uh, but of course, the definitive uh, comparison nowadays needs to be made to NOAX, and so that's obviously will happen with the CHAMPION trial, as you know. So we're just outside now. We're starting to get there, yeah? Can you so describe? Watch your feet. So yeah. the feet are right up against the wall. So Pratik has it exactly where he wants to be. And you can see the contrast moving uh, very easily through the device with that little test puff. So this is exactly where he needs to be. Let's hold the respirations, please. All right, so you lost a little bit of ground there. And you're getting it back perfect. So feet are not restrained, device is flowering. You're gonna have to lean on it a little bit. And boom, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right, looking good here. That's a one and done. So Bob, what are you looking at right now? So we've got a 3D looking at the device right now, and we're actually looking on FOSS at this point. You can still see that there's the wire holding the Watchman device right there, and then we can go into our actual imaging of the individual images. I'll go back to 2D, that's what most everybody is comfortable with. You can see that we've got really no shoulder on this whatsoever in the uh, 45. And the 135 also is looking very, very favorable. Um, I do not see any color flow initially. Uh, we're using a normal Nyquist limit of 58 right now. Uh, frame rate's a little bit down when we go into biplane imaging, so if we stick with just standard 2D imaging, that really tends to help increase the frame rate. We're at 23 right now. 45 looks great. Zero right here also is looking wonderful. I'm not seeing anything there. We'll swing it out to 90. And again, see a little bit right through the center, and that's normal. That is not anything outside of the device. And we'll go over to here, 135 an real quick. This looks great. So, so now talk us through the tug test, uh, Pratik. Yeah, so the most important thing here is going to loosen the TUI. It's important to create a runway to see it. I like to do it on Cine. It's a little negative retraction on the device and just kind of make sure it goes back as it did there. A little that bit slow good. to return. That looks great there. On echo, we saw it move. The other thing that you can, back. yeah, you can also appreciate just the shape of the device on Cine, right, is absolutely the way it should be. Um, it's appropriately flowered. 
like the 3D images on, on TEE that Bob just showed. I mean, the device is perfectly deployed. I mean, this is a one and done. So Dr. Dalal is doing an angio, and that's, that looks great. that's as good as it'd be. Right, you see the little bit of the pouch uh, just on that one side that you're not really gonna try to cover. It's not worth it. All the small little ridges are covered, and all the, all the dye is going through the fabric. Oh, that's perfect. Is there a compression on the lower end that you, you know, is it your lower limit that you will not leave? And is there an upper end compression where you worried that, you know, being over compressed and the theoretical risk of it right. getting so spit the, out? Right, so the lower end is, I'm really not so comfortable with single digits, even though obviously, you know, 8% is theoretically okay. Um, I'd like to see teens. Uh, as far as upper end, that depends on the position of the device, because I have to say, I have left devices at 30% compressed and been perfectly comfortable with that. Um, but if it's proximal, that's not so good, right? That's the fear. Um, and then we can talk about, obviously, I mean, we can look at this, there's no shoulder, there's, there's no shoulder. none. Uh, but obviously in some geometries, you have to leave a shoulder, how much of a shoulder you're gonna leave. Uh, it's obviously a judgment call. Uh, if you're adequately compressed, but if your fabric is covering it, you know, in difficult anatomies, the shoulder's okay as well. And while Bob is getting his compression measurements, what I wanted to ask you was, um, are we pretty comfortable saying that anything less than five millimeters in terms of gap is something to leave, or, or do we still not yet know what a safe gap is, and we're just using five as the number based upon um, some observational series? It's... That's a complicated question, right? Because you have to then, what are, how are you defining as safe? Are we defining safe as a long-term risk of thromboembolism? Are we talking safe as a long-term risk of further uh, leak or persistent leak? Are we defining it as even potential risk of DRT? Um, and it also depends on the imaging modality because all these criteria are just based on large prospective right. trials where your outcome was favorable, and those leak measurements are based on TEE. Now, as we have been learning about CT imaging to follow these patients, which is you know, appropriate these days because we're doing CT instead of TEE in this COVID era, um, we know that we're finding leaks that we didn't see before. Right. And using the same number obviously doesn't intuitively make sense, but what do we have? We still have old data, very good data, regarding outcomes, and these patients do well. Um, so I think we still go by the acceptable, you know, four millimeters or less is okay, but having said that, I mean, you know, if, we, if you're four or five millimeters, you're gonna redeploy right, and, exactly. at acute, and if it, you're one millimeter and it's a difficult deployment, you're gonna leave it, and I think it's as simple as right. that. So Bob, what do you think? So I don't know what the compression numbers are there, Christy. We have 15 to 29.2% compression. So go ahead and repeat those. 15 to 29% compression, depending upon the angle that we're at. So I'll have Dr. Doshi go through the pass criteria, and, and if he's happy, I think we'll just release the device yeah. and come out. So position, anchor, size, and seal, and we have everything, right? The position is appropriate. Bob's given us these great pictures. We're at the level of the circumflex. There's no shoulder. Uh, the device is well anchored. We had a nice tug test. Uh, the size of the device looks appropriate. The seal, we don't see any color flow around anything, no jets. Uh, and I mean, 15 to 29% is obviously there. I mean, yeah. we typically take the lower number, right? Uh, and so, uh, this is adequately depressed. I think we chose the correct size, and we have no leak. This is, let's just put it this way, I would have detached and I would be unscrubbed. All the time <laughs> well, let's do that. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Ready? Okay, great. So this is, you guys made this look uh, pathetically easy. I think it took us more time to do your PowerPoint uh, <laughs> critique than to uh, deploy this. Great, great work, Pratik. Um, uh, Pratik, why don't you manage the, uh, the access site? Uh, Dr. Burke, and why don't you come on over here with me, mm -hmm. uh, Ro? Uh, Dr. Burke, uh, add anything else uh, on your imaging right now? 
No, we're also just going to look and make sure we've got, uh, typically we have left to right shunting afterward, and that's the most common situation with the uh, little septal puncture that we've got. Bob, how often do you see, obviously not applicable in this case because, I mean, Pratik's stick was perfect, the sheath was absolutely coaxial on release, but how often do you see wire bias change the relative position once you detach the device? Actually, we do see that. Uh, and it's interesting because more often than not, the wire bias will create or sort of propagate a little bit of a shoulder. And once we get rid of the wire, it's able to settle back in and actually look quite a bit better than what we might have thought when we're doing our original imaging. So I have a couple of questions for you, Roel. Mm -hmm. While uh, Bob continues to give us some superb images and uh, Pratik is uh, taking care of the access site. First, in, in most electrophysiologic and interventional procedures, the EP doctor or the interventional cardiologist, hands down the most important person in the room. <laughs> uh, to me, the most important person in the room for this kind of case or mitral clip, it's the echo guy. I'm, I'm a, I feel like I'm a distant second. Do, do you agree with that? I, I think from a technical standpoint in straightforward anatomy, uh, this is a simple, simplistic procedure if you're guided by appropriate imaging. And I think that's the key. So I would wholeheartedly agree. This is an imaging procedure and the degree of expertise with imaging drives this. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, both from a safety standpoint and just in terms of the user usability, right? It's just in that guidance is essential. In difficult anatomies, a little bit of hands and feel and experience goes a long way. You have to be able to twirl That's catheters. Right. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Um, Second question is, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't release this device thinking it's a good uh, and effective deployment. We have to know it. And we have the technology mm -hmm. and the experience to do that. You agree with that? Yes, absolutely. So we don't just think it's a good, okay. And then finally, um, and, and Bob, jump in here on this as well. Where is, where is this franchise going? Where is this space going? You know, with Champion AF, uh, we could be looking five years down the road or even three years down the road at a very different patient population uh, and a different uh, method for uh, adjudicating what's an appropriate case than we are today. I think that's, so if the question is, is this therapy here to say, well, every, here to stay, you know, every, anything, any sort of way you can think about this would suggest that that's the case, right? So obviously we already have tremendous prospective randomized data that at least this is non-inferior to warfarin. We have long-term data that suggests the mortality benefit superior to warfarin. There is data, uh, surprisingly, though it's not the prospective data that we need for NOACs, that it's at least uh, as good as NOAX, and in fact, and I make this point a lot because there's good data in our world related to NOAC therapy, and everybody thinks that NOACs are a godsend. The compliance rate or the discontinuation rate with NOACs is actually just as bad as it is with warfarin, and the potential for thrombogenesis with discontinuation of NOACs is incredibly high, uh, higher than with warfarin. And so there's a risk factor here uh, that we have to consider. And thus, it's important to do a trial like Champion, where you're comparing left atrial appendage occlusion with current NOAC therapy, right? So that's obviously gonna be a very important trial going forward and would potentially drive a greater usage. If we just look at the technologies, right, there are going to be a whole host of these devices on the marketplace in the near future. Uh, and other types of therapies that are being used specifically targeting the appendage. And then again, from an electrophysiology standpoint, um, I think the other critical trial is looking at in combination for treating atrial fibrillation, i.e. catheter ablation, right? So right now our guidelines say that even if we do a successful ablation, patients are at high risk for thromboembolism by Chad's vascor continue on anticoagulation. Well, the other in my mind, pivotal trial in this space is option, which is looking at prospectively using appendage occlusion in conjunction with catheter ablation for AF. Um, that's kind of, to me, the best of both worlds. So, Bob, anything else to add to that? No, I think that's really where we're headed. And it, it's just a matter of 
people being comfortable with the concept of having a mechanical therapy uh, for what's been generally considered a pharmacologic problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we haven't adapted that 100%, but I think that as the technology has developed and the fact that the safety is so great um, with Watchmen, even in new operators, as you can tell from uh, studies that have been done, that uh, this is something that should be used really getting more as a first line option for people that are going to get into trouble predictably with antithrombotic therapy. Well, Pratik, excellent job deploying that. You. You, you, you're, you're a pro, you made that look uh, easy. Okay. Uh, it was really spectacular. Thank you very much, Ro. That Your commentary you, during this was, was uh, just spectacular. I wanna thank you for joining us for this Watchman implantation. Uh, I'm David Reisick from uh, Honor Health, and we look forward to having you for our next SIF virtual session. Thank you for joining us.